quantum computing is doomed to fail. Companies are finally realizing how much money it will take to build a quantum computer that's good for at least something. But there's a much deeper problem at the bottom of all this, which tech giants are trying to hide from everyone. In 1998, Isaac Chuang, Neil Gershenfeld, and Mark Kubinek from the University of California, Berkeley, presented the world with the first ever quantum computer. It had only two quantum bits or qubits. Fast forward 25 years into the future, and you're looking at IBM, who presented the Condor. This is a quantum computer chip that had not two, not four, not 100, but 1,121 superconducting qubits. The chip had a 50% increase in qubit density and over a mile of flex cabling. Now, all of these numbers and fancy words might sound impressive to someone just hearing about qubits and quantum computers, but in reality, this quote-unquote breakthrough is boring. If you notice, while IBM was quick to boast about their numbers and their qubits, they said almost nothing about the chip's performance. In other words, what are the benefits of having over 1,000 chips in a quantum processor? Is it better than the previous models? How does that help programmers and scientists using these supercomputers? But I suppose that was their idea. Give as little information about the real-world applications of this chip, and instead boast about how many qubits you were able to fit on a single processor. And this is not just my opinion. If you go and smash that like button, just like you should, if you haven't done so already. But no, in all seriousness, if you go and look at IBM's development roadmap, you will see that they predicted the number of qubits will increase exponentially from 2019 onward. Starting with the Falcon, which had about 27 qubits, they followed that up with the Hummingbird, boasting 65 qubits, and then came the Eagle, with 127 qubits, the Osprey had 433 qubits in 2022, and the Condor, the processor we discussed, with 1,121 qubits. In 2024, they were supposed to come up with Flamingo, which would boast over 1,386 qubits, and in 2025, they would make the big leap, jumping to 4,158 qubits with Kookaburra. From 2026 onward, IBM planned to introduce the first 10,000 qubit chip and eventually build a chip that would have over 100,000 qubits. IBM quickly realized that this was an overly ambitious goal, and recently, they posted a new development roadmap. Do you notice anything different about this one? How about if we zoom in a little? Still nothing. Well, why don't you pay attention to the number of qubits, and don't let the 5K in Flamingo's name fool you. They're not referring to the number of qubits. They're actually talking about gates. The new Flamingo processors will have 5K gates but stay at 1,092 qubits. But it's worth pointing out that Flamingo 5K will come out in 2025. This year, they came up with Heron 5K, which had only 399 qubits. In 2026, they are expecting to have Flamingo 7.5K. Then the next year, they'll come up with Flamingo 10K. And in 2028, they will work on Flamingo 15K and every single one of them will have 1,092 qubits. IBM will focus all of its efforts on something called error correction. And remember this term because it's gonna be important later on. It won't be until 2029 that IBM will introduce Starling with 100 million gates. From this, you can see that they extended the exponential growth by three more years, expecting major leaps at the end of this decade. But this tells me something very important about IBM and quantum computing in general. Companies are becoming more and more cautious about throwing money at quantum problems because they know money will not solve quantum computing problems. And this realization is not exclusive to IBM. D-Wave and Regetti, two major quantum computing companies, are at threat of being delisted from the stock exchange because their stock price has fallen extremely low in the past years. And something similar is happening with PsyQuantum. They are one of the biggest quantum computing companies that recently received an investment directly from the Australian government. How big was the investment? Well, how does 940 million Australian dollars sound? Because that's how much PsyQuantum received to install a 1 million qubit machine in Australia by 2027. However, not everyone agreed with the Australian government's policy. Many opposition leaders requested someone conduct a major investigation to see where these funds were going, especially single PsyQuantum, a US-based company. Speaking of US-based companies, Google made some brilliant discoveries in the field of error correction. Here's where error correction becomes an important term. You see, just like IBM, Google uses the same quantum computing technology. The only thing that's different is Google's using superconducting qubits, 
and the striking discovery they made is that error correction improves as predicted when there are more qubits. Now, in quantum computing, it's very important to prevent errors from creeping into the system. That's why each qubit is paired with other qubits. This, in turn, creates a redundancy. For example, if you want to check on a qubit, you can use the paired qubits to correct the errors. But the problem is like a double-edged sword. If we take the condor with 1,121 qubits and pair each of those with six more qubits, then we might have enough qubits to check on the 1,121 original qubits. But we've just introduced 6,726 more qubits to solve this problem. And there's the problem. The errors grow exponentially. It's like a hydra's head. You cut one and two more pop out. So while adding more qubits might sound like a good idea in theory, in practice, it just creates a lot of headaches. What Google managed to prove with their research is that after a certain threshold, the number of errors decreases when you increase the number of qubits. So what Google discovered, IBM can use as well because they use the same technology. So does this mean that IBM should actually be working on expanding their qubits and not their gates? Did IBM make a mistake? Google proved that once companies reach the qubit quantity threshold, error correction is no longer a problem. So, does that mean companies need to focus on increasing the number of qubits? And error correction will simply fix itself. Well, that's like saying a bigger phone is a better phone. You see, before companies begin expanding the number of qubits, they need to make sure someone can actually use those qubits. So, when you increase the number of qubits, you need to make sure the error correction works. And we're not talking only about the error buildup because of decoherence. The chips come with something called an internal drift, which is a complex term that simply means the system changes by itself even when you don't want it to. And when working with qubits, it is not the same as working with bits. If you alter one qubit, that could affect the other due to something called crosstalk. Now, error correction, internal drift, and crosstalk are not the end of quantum computing. They're solvable problems, but they're difficult problems. It takes a lot of time to solve them, which is why quantum computers have been evolving so slowly. And this is where the unsolvable problem comes into play. As hard as those previous three problems might be, they're all solvable. What's not solvable is the money paradox. Let me explain. The problem with quantum computing right now is that it's not suited for any real world or commercial use. No company can use a quantum computer for calculations or anything else. It might be decades before computer engineers solve the three major quantum computing problems, which in turn cause the money paradox. According to some experts, solving these problems will take so much money that they might never justify the investment. That's like buying a million dollar popcorn machine that earns you $20 per day. No matter how long the machine works, you will never get your money back. And the scary thing with quantum computers is that we don't know if they'll be commercially viable or how commercially viable they will be. In other words, those $20 we were talking about, they're not guaranteed with quantum computers. Some think that we would need tens of billions of dollars to make quantum computers commercially viable. Some more conservative analysts think that number is higher than $100 billion. And this is the first, least powerful version. Imagine if Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs walked in front of an investor, showed them their first quote-unquote computer, or blue box, and said, we'll need $10 million to build more of these. Do you think we'd have the computer of today? Of course, not. Which is why we think quantum computing is headed for a colossal downfall. Here's another video AI enthusiasts loved watching. This is AI Exposed, demystifying the world of artificial intelligence, one video at a time. 